It's such a pleasure to be with you here today. And if you haven't joined us before, this talk is going to focus on a different topic. It does build a little bit on the previous two talks, uh, but this talk really brings it all to a conclusion. How do we address this, this overwhelming issue of, of what we humans are doing to our world in a Christian framework in an atmosphere where so often there is so much disagreement, so much conflict, so much argument, so much resistance. As always, uh, Dave and I are going to be taking your questions at the end, and we're going to be doing so using Poll EV. So um, I'll put the link in the chat right here. Uh, so you can just click on that link, pollev.com slash Catherine. And I won't do what I did the other two mornings, which is what was really fun. I put up a map and people could click where they were joining from. But today I'm going to ask you a question just to make sure this is working for you. And the question I'm gonna ask you is, how are you feeling today? Uh, give me a word. If you need to use more than one word, then use a dot to connect those words. But how are you feeling today? Wherever you are in the world, whether it's morning or evening. Yep, that could apply either to morning or evening. <laughs> Tired and refreshed. That's possible both ways, right? Both physically and mentally. Connected, inspired, good. Well, hopefully this will, if you're feeling a little tired, go ahead and get your coffee or get your tea. I have my own tea right here. Um, if you're feeling, don't worry, you can turn off your camera and just watch and listen. Um, if you're feeling hopeful and excited, we're definitely going to go there today. And I love the fact that the biggest word is inspired. That's fantastic. All right, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and open up the questions right now. So from now on, surfing without a surfboard, that's kind of interesting. That could be, that could be literal or that could actually be, be metaphorical. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and open the questions right now. And so at any time during the presentation, you're gonna be able to type a full question into polyv.com. And again, the fun part is you can upvote the questions you most want Dave and I to get to. And as you know, the last few mornings, we have had way more questions than we could get to in the 15 minutes we have at the end. So don't forget, even if you don't have a question, check out the questions as we go along and upvote the ones that you most want us to get to and you most want answered. Here are the questions. Let's see, here are the questions right here and they will stay open the whole time. You will be able to see them in your, on your phone or on your browser or wherever you click on polyv.com slash Catherine. So over the last two days, I've talked about what we're doing to our planet. And um, in an essay I wrote with one of my colleagues a few years ago, this is what we concluded. We said, regardless of the fact that we might not have known what we were doing 300 years ago, we are truly conducting an unprecedented experiment with the only planet that we have. And we've known what, we're do what we've been doing for actually a very long time. This is not new news. In the 1800s, scientists like Joseph Fourier, Eunice Foote, and John Tyndale from France, from upstate New York in the United States, and from Galway in Ireland, they discovered that carbon dioxide is the thermostat of the planet, that when we increase levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it warms the planet. They even connected the dots to digging up and burning coal and the fact that it produces more heat-trapping gases. They're wrapping an extra blanket around the planet. By the 1950s, scientists, I should say by the 1960s, scientists knew enough about climate change to formally warn a US president of the risks posed by a warming planet. This headline says scientists warned a US president 50 years ago, but you'll notice that this headline is over five years old because the date when he was warned was 1965. So that's over 55 years ago that scientists were convinced enough about the risks of climate change to formally warn a president that the United States and other countries really should be doing something about it. We talked yesterday about how every new scientific headline seems to tell us that climate is changing faster to a greater extent than we thought. That scientists are able to put numbers on exactly how much stronger or more frequent or more damaging climate change made a given hurricane, heat wave, wildfire, or flood. So the question that this begs is, why are we not treating this like an emergency. And there's an even bigger question often for those of us who are immersed in uh, Christian culture, which is why when we see Christians, prominent Christian leaders speaking about this issue, 
which as we discussed the previous two days relates directly to what we believe as Christians from Genesis 1, where it talks about how humans have responsibility over every living thing on this planet, to Revelation, where it says God will destroy those who destroy the earth, and to everything in between that talks about God's love and care for the most tiniest and insignificant aspects of nature, and the fact that we Christians are to be recognized by our love for others, particularly those who are vulnerable, who are suffering, who are marginalized, who do not have what we have, the benefits that we have. And those are the very people who are being most affected by climate change. So rather than dragging our heels at the end of the line, if we truly take the Bible seriously, we would be out at the front of the line demanding climate action. So why is it when we see Christian leaders speak up about climate change, all too often it looks like this. Christians launch a campaign against global warming hype. Over 100 signatories backed by prominent Christians, including Tony Perkins, James Dobson, and others. You see sermons on YouTube by recognized names like John MacArthur talking about the global warming hoax. And almost every day on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, in emails I get, in blogs that people write, in handwritten and hand-typed letters they actually put in the mail and send to me, almost every day I hear at least one of these religiously sounding objections. In fact, they are so popular that our Global Weirding series, and Rick can put a, a link in the chat here probably, our Global Weirding series, one of the most popular episodes that we have in that series is called What Does the Bible Say About Climate Change? And it addresses these popular religiously sounding myths, and it is the episode that almost the most people have watched because we hear these myths so frequently. So what religiously sounding myths do we hear? If God is in control, how could this happen? The world is going to end anyway, so why do we care? In fact, some people say, hey, maybe this will hurry it up. Maybe this will bring it on sooner. Others claim God promised that we would always have seasons and the world would never be covered in water again, so all those projections of what's going to happen with climate change must be false. Some just cut right to the chase and say, oh, those scientists are godless liberal atheists. Why should we believe what they say? And others go whole hog and say, well, it's just earth worshiping. They're actually a false religion with false prophets. And I would say probably one of the most common names that I'm often called by people who identify as Christian is false prophet. So let's look briefly at each of these in detail. Do they hold any water? Well, starting with the most popular one, if God is in control, how could this happen? And we hear this frequently. We hear it a lot, not only from religious or Christian leaders, but from political leaders, especially conservative political leaders, most often in the United States, but we also have heard it from people in Australia and people in Canada who are using their faith as a sort of palatable window dressing for their objections. And here's one, Senator Jim Inhofe from Oklahoma. Back in 2012, he said, God is still up there. The arrogance of people to think that we human beings would be able to change what he is doing in the climate is to me outrageous. This sounds religious -y. It sounds respectful of God's authority, doesn't it? But is it truth? No. We've already looked at how when we go to the Bible in Genesis 1, book 1, chapter 1, it says, God made human beings in his image for a reason. Why? To rada, to care for, to protect, to have responsibility for every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. And in the Psalms, it goes even further. It literally says, heaven belongs to the Lord, but he gave the earth to people. So it may sound pious. It may sound respectful to say, how dare we assume that people can interfere with God, what God is doing. But in the Bible, it says in black and white that God gave us humans responsibility over this home. And when we fail to take it, that is what shows disrespect. That is what shows a lack of belief. So what about the next one? The world will end anyway, so why do we care? Well, it's so interesting because people being people, people were saying the exact same thing back when the Apostle Paul and other apostles were writing the New Testament. In fact, in the city of Thessalonica, who received the letters to the Thessalonians, there were people there who were saying, well, Christ is going to return any day, so let's just quit our jobs and lay around waiting. Maranatha, come, Lord, come. 
And the Apostle Paul wrote to them and, rather politely for him, basically told them to get off their rears. Stop leaning back in the lazy boy waiting for the world to end. Get a job, feed your family, care for the poor and the widows and the orphans. And he went on to explain in detail how we don't know what the future holds. We don't know the date or the time. But in the meantime, putting together other parts of the New Testament, as I talked about yesterday, in the meantime, we are called to walk in the good works that God has prepared for us in advance. And those good works consist of showing love and care to other people and other living things here on this planet today. Good works does not consist of folding our hands and waiting for the end of the world. It may sound pious, but it is not. It is the exact opposite of what we are told to do as Christians in this world. Then there's um, sort of uh, almost humorous examples like, well, God said that there would always be winter and summer, and God said that he would never flood the earth again. So you can't say that global warming is real and sea levels rising. That's what we call a straw man argument, because scientists never said that the entire Earth's surface would flood. In fact, we have calculated just how much sea level would rise if all of Greenland and all of Antarctica melted. And it would certainly inundate the coastal areas where more than 700 million people currently live, yes, but it would not inundate the entire world. And when it comes to seasons, the reason we have seasons is because the tilt of the Earth's axis of rotation is tilted 23 and a half degrees relative to the plane of the orbit. So we will still have winter, spring, summer, fall because of the tilt of the Earth's axis of rotation relative to the plane of the orbit. But each one of those will be warmer. Winter will be warmer, spring will be warmer, summer will be warmer, and fall will be warmer. We'll still have the seasons, they'll just be warmer. Then people sometimes, like I said, they just cut right to the chase. They don't bother with any of these details. They just say, why believe the scientists? Those scientists are godless liberal atheists. This is where I find the work of my colleague Elaine Eklund so fascinating. Elaine is a sociologist at Rice University, which is in Houston, Texas. And a number of years ago, when she was living in Chicago, she was attending a Presbyterian church there near Wheaton. And during the, the time when you greet people, you know, you stand up and shake people's hand and kind of chit chat a little bit. In the course of conversation with the woman in front of her, the woman said to her, well, you know, those scientists, they're all godless liberal atheists. But Elaine, being a sociologist, thought to herself, hmm, I wonder if they really are. So she decided to devote her career to figuring out what scientists think about religion and what Christians think about science. So the first thing she did was she set out in the United States and she interviewed 1,700 scientists at top research universities across the United States. And what she found is that fully 50% of us identify with a specific religious label. And then when she extended her survey to people who are in scientific professions, like medicine and engineering, and they're working as scientists outside of academia, there she found that 76% of people in scientific professions identify with a specific religious label. They would say, I am a, I am a Christian, I am a Buddhist, I am a Muslim, I am a Hindu, I am a. She also found that 70% of scientists consider themselves to be spiritual people and that they think that there's more to life than what science can quantify and observe and measure. And even more fascinatingly, of the 30% who identify as atheists, 20% of those insisted to her that they were spiritual atheists. And that was really interesting. She's like, well, what do you mean by that? And she had great conversations with people trying to figure out what do you mean that you're a spiritual atheist? So the reality is, is that there's a lot more people who are uh, spiritual people who believe in God and who do top-notch science than you'd think. We are not unicorns. But then there's the last argument. And the last argument that it's just an earth-worshipping religion is one that is particularly espoused by politicians. This man is a senator in the state where I live, Texas, and back in 2015, he said, climate change is not science, it's religion. Another senator from South Carolina went further. He said, we know who did it. It was Al Gore. He's the one who turned this thing into a religion. And if you search the internet, of course, you can find the proof because the proof to anything is on the internet. Here we have the Church of Climatology, and if you look very carefully, you'll see that somebody has photoshopped my head onto the choir. What's the reality? The reality is, is that there is a broad spectrum of perspectives on our home, 
And between worshiping it and treating it like garbage, there are a lot of different options, aren't there? It isn't just a binary A or B, black or white, either worship it or treat it like garbage. How about caring for it? How about protecting it? How about viewing it like you would your home? Keep up on the repairs and make sure it's clean. There's a lot of things we can do to care for our home that just makes sense, as well as fulfilling our God-given responsibility for it without having to worship it. So this is what we would also call another straw man argument. A straw man argument is where you make up something ridiculous, like those scientists said the entire world would be flooded, and then you make fun of them for it. Or you make up something ridiculous, like those Arasha people said we have to worship the earth, and then we make fun of it for them, for it. That's a straw man argument, where you create a false statement, and then you ridicule people for that false statement. The reality, of course, is that if people go so far as to make up those false statements, it's because they can't disagree with what you really say. And what we really say is it's not a matter of worshiping the earth, but worshiping the creator and respecting the responsibility that he has given us on his behalf. The bottom line, I think, was really expressed best by Bishop Ephraim Tendero. He was the former Secretary General of the World Evangelical Alliance. He cares about climate change so much that he was actually an official delegate for his country, the Philippines, to the climate negotiations in Paris in 2015. A North American evangelical once asked Bishop Ephraim, Bishop F., why he cares about climate change, adding accusingly, don't you read the scriptures? Yes, Bishop F. replied, I do read the scriptures, and that is exactly why I care. So what are these religious-sounding objections, really? They are not based on what we truly believe. In fact, if I had to pick a single verse in the Bible to describe the Christians who object to the reality of climate change, to the severity of its risks, to the urgency of action, I would pick this verse from the book of James. It talks about someone who listens to the word but does not do what it says, speaking of the Bible, is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. We are not acting like who we are, even though we put window dressing, religiously sounding window dressing on our objections, we have forgotten who we are. We have forgotten who God has made us. What does a Christian response really look like? I found this letter that a student, a high school student, wrote to Billy Graham back in 2004. And it's on the Billy Graham website. You can still find it today. And I just wanted to read you a little bit of this because I just love it so much. So the student wrote in and said, do you think we might be on the road to destroying the world? I'm very concerned about things like global warming and pollution. And I'm even thinking about a career in environmental science. So what did Billy Graham say? It's just a hoax. Don't worry about it. God is in control. The world's going to end anyways. No. Here's what he said. He said, I'm not a scientist, of course, but... I've talked with many scientists who share your concern. Remember the verse we talked about yesterday about how God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power to be able to act, love to have compassion on others, and a sound mind to make good decisions based on the information we get, which includes science. So this is basically what Billy Graham is saying. I've talked with many scientists who share your concern, and I'm thankful for all those who are seeking to make our world a better and safer place. Perhaps God wants you to be one of those people. I believe Christians especially should be concerned about the environment. Not also, but especially because we know it's God's world. God created it. God put us here to be stewards, to take care of it, to use it responsibly. And then he goes on to say, why haven't we done this? So he acknowledges that we have failed. Why are we so careless? We've forgotten that it's God's. We act as if we're the center of the universe. Our lives are ruled by greed and selfishness, and we don't care what happens to others. Couldn't say it better myself. So this then leaves us with two more big questions, right? How did being a Christian become synonymous in some circles, and I want to emphasize some circles, with rejecting the truth of what God's creation is telling us and our God-given desire to love others as he loved us? And even if this is true, what are we supposed to do about it? I'm just one person. So I want to emphasize that I travel and I speak to people all over the world and I hear people express doubts of the science. And whenever I do, 
if I'm outside the US, I ask them where they heard it. And I have never encountered, I may still in the future, but so far I have never encountered a situation where somebody who is a Christian was expressing doubts that climate change was real or human caused or serious or that action was needed, where their opinion and their perspective could not be ultimately traced back to messages, to framing, to materials, to people who originated in the United States. So there is certainly religiously sounding climate denial in Australia, in Canada, it exists in the UK. I was giving a talk in the UK a few years ago and the person who invited me to speak at a group of scientists who are Christians, he said, oh, you don't have to talk about Christian-y sounding objections. Nobody believes those here. And I said, oh, okay, well, that's great news. I'm not quite sure I'm convinced of that, but it's great if you don't think anybody believes those. And then the next day I got an email from the minister of a church not too far away in the UK from where I was giving my talk at Cambridge. And he said, can you please help me? Because my congregation has been listening to all these videos from the United States and they're telling me that climate change isn't real. And why are we, why am I preaching about this issue? So unfortunately, it is infiltrating Christian circles around the world. It's being translated into various languages, through materials, through people who have taken this message and made it their own. But it primarily originates in the United States. And so that's why when I'm answering this first question, I'm going to focus on the U.S. as well as extending it to other countries. In the United States, they did a survey a number of years ago asking how concerned people were about climate change by religious affiliation. And what they found is that white Catholics and white evangelical Protestants are at the very bottom of the barrel together. But here's the interesting thing. Who's the most concerned people? Hispanic Catholics. How could Hispanic Catholics be most concerned and white Catholics be least concerned when they have the same Pope who wrote the same encyclical, right? Laudato Si, talking all about climate change and why it mattered to Christians and why it was so urgent and why we needed to address it. This is a big clue that what is going on is not who's in charge of the church or what Bible they read or where they go and they sit on a Sunday or a Saturday. There's something else going on. What makes Hispanic Catholics different than white Catholics? I'll give you a clue. It's not the word Catholic, is it? So John Evans is a researcher at um, UC San Diego, and he does a lot of really interesting studies. He found that compared to not actively religious people, conservative Protestants, he was focusing only on conservative Protestants, not Catholics, conservative Protestants are less likely to believe the conclusiveness of climate science. But being a social scientist, he was able to disentangle why that is. And he found that it was not where and how and when they go to church that causes this effect. It was the fact that their opinions were rooted in political conservatism and the Republican Party. And the idea that political ideology has taken over conservative Christianity in the United States and increasingly in Canada and Australia as well, it is nothing new. In 1992, historian Mark Knoll wrote a book called The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. He doesn't mention climate change there, but he talks all about how politics has been eating away at Christian belief in the United States since the American Revolution. That's right. Since the American Revolution, ideology, politics, and the Christian faith has become increasingly intertwined in the United States to the point where many people today who call themselves Christians have a statement of faith that is written first by their political ideology and only a very distant second by the Bible. And if the two come into conflict, they will go with their political ideology over the Bible. It's so pronounced that I even have a term for it. I call them political Christians as opposed to theological Christians. And just to give you one example, during the um, two two elections ago in the U.S., so not the most recent one when Biden was election, elected, but the previous one when Trump was elected, they surveyed people afterwards and they said, would you consider yourself to be an evangelical Christian? And of course, a lot of people who voted for Trump said, yes, they would consider themselves to be an evangelical Christian. Then they asked people a simple question. Do you go to church? 
Now, of course, going to church isn't necessarily a hallmark of being an evangelical Christian, but in general, if you take your faith seriously, you tend to go to church, right? In general, or some form of church. Might be going to church on the internet these days. I've been doing a lot of that myself. But we, we would answer yes to that question, most of us, even if we view going to church as sitting out in God's creation and worshiping him there. But here's the thing, 50% of the people who voted for Trump and self-identified as evangelical said that they never go to church. Never. That's what I call a political Christian. So Galen Carey has served as um, in many roles for the National Association of Evangelicals in the U.S. And he said something very insightful a number of years ago. He said, many evangelicals oppose action to slow climate change, not on a religious basis, but politically because they believe the government wants to take away their freedom. And we actually see this in the words of the very same senator who said in 2012, you know, how outrageous it is to think you hope humans can control the climate. He said, do you realize I was on your side when I first chaired the Senate Environment Committee and I heard about it? I was on your side till when? Till I opened the Bible? Till I listened to a sermon? No, I was on your side until I found out what it would cost to fix it. <sighs> this is the real problem. We as Christians in rich countries, we have let the world rather than the Bible shape our beliefs. We've done exactly what Billy Graham warned Jerry Falwell, who of course was very responsible for the confluence of politics and religion in the 1980s with the whole moral majority thing. He warned him 40 years ago, he said, the hard right has no interest in religion except to manipulate it. So as a result, we are often told by people who we believe share our beliefs that we can't trust what God's creation is telling us. We can't trust what science says, and we shouldn't love or care for the marginalized, the poor, or the vulnerable. They deserve what they have. I'm paraphrasing here, but that is certainly the message that we hear from many. And of course, this is exactly opposed to what we believe. So why have things gotten worse rather than better? Well, in the United States, and this is happening actually around the world, but it's worse in the United States. So I'm using the U.S. as an example, but we do see this elsewhere, too. We have seen that we are becoming more polarized over time. In 1994, the median Democrat was closer to the median Republican. The median liberal was closer to the median conservative than they were to people at the tails of their own party. Yet over time, what has happened? They've become further and further apart. And in fact, in 2017, when they just looked at who voted, this is what it looked like. I don't know if you've had a chance to read The Righteous Mind, a fascinating book, but it talks about how since the 1980s, the U.S. has experienced a steady increase in what they call emotional polarization. People who identify with one of the two main political parties increasingly hate and fear, hate and fear. Those are not Christian words. The other party and people in it. Partisanship has become negative. You vote for somebody because you hate the other people, not because you love who you're voting for. Partisan attachments are increasingly not even ideology, they're identity. People are seeing their identity not as child of God, not as God's creation, but as Republican or conservative first, and then what they believe second. And they even found shockingly that people will follow the views of their party, even when those views diverge from their independent judgments and they don't even realize it. So we are changing our mind about things all the time, just because of what people we trust tell us. And sometimes we might even not realize we're doing it until it's too late. A report that came out a year ago, last June found even worse People who identify themselves as either one side or the other of the political aisle, they view other people more as enemies. Compromise is viewed as weakness and their gain is seen as our loss. What does this have to do with climate change? Well, sadly, almost everything in terms of our views, because it turns out the number one predictor of whether we agree with 200 years of science and what the Bible says about responsibility for our planet and for every living thing that inhabits it, including our sisters and our brothers, it turns out the number one predictor of whether we agree is where we fall in the political spectrum. As of last year in February, the most politicized issue in the entire United States was climate change. That's where people were furthest apart on any issue. Then of course, COVID happened. The gray bar shows how far people are apart, depending on which political party they affiliate. Then COVID happened, and in August 2020, 
these, these things changed a little bit. Now, I'm, they're not in the same order here, so I'm going to highlight number three, two, and one. It turned out that coronavirus became the third most politicized issue in the U.S. Race and ethnic inequality became number two, but climate change was still number one. When you ask people, is there solid evidence of recent global warming due mostly to human activities, and you look at how much science people know, how good they are at understanding science, it, it gets to where, you know, if you understand science, you agree a little bit more. But if you divide these two groups into conservative and liberal, it turns out that the more conservative people are, the less likely they are to agree with the facts, the smarter they are. Why? Because the smarter we are, the better we are to just cherry pick the information that shows that we're right. And this was found in a study by Dan Cahan, a colleague of mine at Yale. I'm going to translate his study into English here. Being smarter doesn't make us more accepting of science. It just makes us better able to prove that what we already thought was correct. Isn't that kind of horrifying? And we see this in other countries. So here's where we're going to go global because I've just been focusing on the US. Across 56 different countries, climate change beliefs, education, and experience were dwarfed by what? By values, ideologies, worldview, and political orientation. The biggest correlation was with political affiliation and even worse, in rich countries, when conservative people are more educated about climate change, they're not as worried about it as people who are liberal. And in low-income countries, though, that wasn't the case. In low-income countries, everybody was more concerned the more they knew. But in rich countries around the world, we are not as concerned if we're more conservative. Why is that? It's because of something called solution aversion. We think that the only viable solutions are bad, but here's the thing. If I say it's a real issue, but I don't wanna fix it, that makes me a bad person and I don't wanna be a bad person. So my brain makes up and looks for and uses religiously sounding, palatable, godly sounding, pious sounding excuses so that I'm not a bad person. But when we really dig into it, it is the idea that the only viable solutions are bad. And of course, this isn't true. What do real climate solutions look like? They look like using our resources more efficiently. We waste over 60% of the energy we produce and over 40% of the food we produce. We just waste it. It would make sense and it would save us money to not be so wasteful. We can replace fossil fuels and alleviate energy poverty in low-income countries with clean sources of energy. And in fact, that is already happening. We can turn nature and ecosystems, the ocean and agriculture into sinks of carbon that take up carbon and put it in the soil and plants where we want it. There's a hundred times more carbon in the biosphere than humans have produced since the dawn of the industrial era. Real solutions benefit people. Remember we talked Oops. Remember we talked yesterday about how there's no way we can meet our sustainable development goals if we leave climate change out of the picture. You have climate action down at number 13, but in reality, I don't think it should be on this list at all. I think we should take it out and put it in an overarching banner because we can't fix poverty or hunger or health or education or equality or clean water. We can't fix these if we don't fix climate change. Just as, oops, just as climate change affects us all, but it affects the poorest and most marginalized the most, in the same way climate solutions help us all, but they help the poor and the marginalized the most. Climate solutions are good for us. Climate solutions save us money. Climate solutions are changing the world right here in Texas. I love telling stories of people uh, uh, in Texas. We've got big army bases that are almost 50% powered by clean energy, not quite, almost. We've got the first carbon neutral airport in North America, in Texas. I talked, remember yesterday, about how we can talk about what's happening in industry. We can talk about what's happening in faith communities around the world. We can talk about what's happening individually, how we are reducing our food waste, Yes, we're changing our light bulbs and recycling. We're eating less meat, more plant-based diets. We're adopting new technology like solar panels and electric cars. That's actually a picture of our roof. My husband surprised us with solar panels a few years ago for Christmas. We can talk about how we're acting together in a community. And I love the USA Arasha program called Love Your Place because it's all about how we are acting together 
as a body, as a community for the benefit of all of us. We can talk about how we're acting wisely, being good stewards of our resources, doing energy audits of our facilities and using the extra funds to help support people, working within our community to help the poor and the disadvantaged who are already being impacted today by climate change. We can act comprehensively and Project Drawdown, if you don't mind putting a link to that in the chat, Project Drawdown is a great resource that talks about a hundred different solutions to climate change. That sure, they do include solar and they do include efficiency, but they've also got letting indigenous people manage their lands and coastal wetland protection and uh, composting and educating women and girls in low-income countries. It's not just that we're scared of the solutions, we're not sufficiently scared of the risks either. Now, don't forget to put your questions in pollev.com. We're gonna to get to those in just a few more minutes and you can upvote the questions you most want to answer. But it isn't only about solution aversion. So we don't only have to tell people about what we can do to fix climate change. We also have to talk about how it matters. Because as humans, all of us, no matter where we live, whether we live in low income, medium income or high income countries, we feel like this is still a distant issue. In the United States, when you ask people, is it happening? Most people will say yes. These are public opinion results by county. Very interesting. If you want to know more about them, you can look up the Yale program on climate communications, climate opinion maps, and actually probably maybe Rick could put a link there to the chat. You ask people, is it happening? They say yes. Will it harm plants and animals? They say yes. Will it harm future generations? They say yes. Will it harm people in developing countries? Probably, a little lighter, but yes. Will it harm people in the US? Ooh, numbers are starting to creep down here. And then they say, will it harm you? Most people say no, except for who? Hispanic Catholics also Native Americans. Those are the most concerned people groups about the risks of climate change because they understand that it's not only about the future or plants and animals. It's not only about people who live in low income countries, it's about here and now. Why don't people think it matters? Because we never talk about it. If we don't talk about it, why would they think they, that it ca they care? This is something that's called psychological distance. The idea that climate is changes distant in time, the future, but not now. Distant in space, over there, not here. Abstract rather than concrete. Global average temperature instead of a stronger hurricane or a bigger wildfire. And irrelevant to our primary concerns. We see it as being about Greenland, Antarctica, Siberia, or the polar bears. Whereas in reality, it's about us. It's about our homes, it's about our energy, it's about our soil, it's about our crops and our agriculture and our water. Climate change is affecting us here and now in ways that matter to us. So what's the real problem? The real problem is that our threat meter is unbalanced. We see climate impacts as being far away, we'll worry about those later, and we see climate solutions as being predominantly bad, negative, harmful. The reality, of course, is exactly the opposite. Climate solutions give us cleaner air and cleaner water. And remember, air pollution from fossil fuels is responsible for nearly 9 million premature deaths every single year. Climate solutions create jobs. They address energy poverty. They alleviate hunger and water scarcity. Climate impacts, on the other hand, are mostly negative. They are decreasing our, the availability of our water. They're leading to longer, stronger droughts, bigger wildfires, more damaging hurricanes, inundation of coastal areas, devastating heat waves. Our threat meter is completely unbalanced. But here's a really interesting ray of hope. Chris is actually a professor at my university, Texas Tech, and he has found that when we talk about how climate change matters to us in ways that are familiar to us and close to us and matter to us, when we reduce psychological distance, we reduce political polarization too. Isn't that absolutely fascinating? So that's why I am absolutely convinced that the first thing we can do to knock over the first domino in the chain that is climate action is to show people why climate change matters to what they already care about, already. 
And what do we care about? We care about our faith. We care about this home that we share. We care about everybody else, our families, our communities, people we know and love, people we don't know and we love. If we can show people that who they already are is the perfect person to care, that climate change is affecting something that they care about today, here and now, and that there are positive solutions that make people's lives better, not worse, today as well as in the future, that is the first step to changing the world. And the good news is every single one of us can do this by having a conversation now. Thank you.